Good evening, everybody. Welcome to worship. My name is John. I'm the pastor here at Vernon, and I want to welcome you. Just a reminder, each and every Wednesday, we only have a couple of these left, uh, we will have worship at 11 a.m., followed by a soup a lunch out the narthex, and then every evening at 5 o'clock, as many of you partook tonight, we will have a meal followed by worship at 6. Tonight, there's choir rehearsal, Tracy, so please, if you could, there's choir rehearsal tonight. Uh, and then uh, also, uh, there's choir rehearsal on Sunday as well after worship, so please, please join us Sunday after worship for choir rehearsal. And uh, what else? Any other announcements? Anybody else? The Petersons finally came back, guys, as, as much as, yeah, is that what we do? We clap? Is that, <laughs> you just got clapped. Uh, speaking of uh, getting excited, can we wave to the people that are joining us online right now at home? Ron likes this part because people all wave to him. This is fun. This is good. Big thanks to Ron and Beth back there for uh, helping us out and streaming and sound and tech and all the above. So with that said, friends, uh, I would invite you to take a breath and then to join me as we enter into worship with our call to worship found on the screen. I invite you to stand as you are able. Friends, this evening I invite you to turn away from the calls of worldly success. Repent and turn back to God. Turn away from the desire to have what everyone else has. Repent and turn back to God. Turn away from the greed and the race for power. Repent and turn back from God. As we enter Lent, may we turn back to God. May we seek forgiveness, may we seek healing, and may we seek wholeness. May our hearts be renewed in this time of worship. And I invite you to sing with me as we praise our God, Rock of Ages. Friends, I invite you to join me in our prayer of the day. The words are on the screen. Let us pray. Merciful God, give us the same attitude as Jesus, who emptied himself and was obedient to you all the way to his death on the cross. Make us eager to put others before ourselves and their needs before our own. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, you may have a seat. And we are blessed uh, to have Selena He and Mrs. K. Simpkin uh, offer up a gift of music tonight for us for reflection.
Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Selena. Selena just started playing piano this evening. That was incredible. No, but thank you so much, Selena. She's a high school student here in town, and, and her teacher is Miss Kay. So what a gift. Uh, friends, we uh, continue to journey together in Lent, and as I promised you, as we began Lent, I would, I would try to stay out of the Gospel of John on our Wednesdays together. Um, and uh, for those who are visiting, we've been in the Gospel of John since January, and, uh, and during our Wednesdays together, we've broken from the Gospel of John. And the story we're about to read today actually appears in all of the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Matthew and Mark's are very similar, and and Luke and John's are kind of similar. Um, And so today we're going to read the story from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in the 26th chapter and the 6th verse. Hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew. Now while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, They were angry, and they said, Why this waste? For this ointment could have been sold for a large sum and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? She has performed a good service for me, for you you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. In a moment, we will hear uh, from a perspective, the perspective of the woman uh, who, who uses this oil. And in the gospel of John, she's named. She's named as Mary. Uh, and, and the beauty of the gospels is these different perspectives that the gospel writers had as they remembered these events 10, 20, 30, 40 years after they took place. And so in some of the events, not only did she dump the perfume on Jesus, but she used her hair to to wash his feet and to anoint him. So we will hear from her perspective at this time. He came with specific instructions. Use it wisely. My grandmother said, it is only for the most special occasion. It had been a gift from her mother, who told her the same thing. Only for the most special occasion. I held it for years, not knowing what could be special enough for this. Until... It was six days before Passover. He was reclined his feet towards me, around him, his followers. I too was a follower, at first at a distance, but he invited us. The women, women, really everyone, to come near to hear his stories of God's curious kingdom. That night, I gathered my perfume from its safe hiding place. The room crowded with men. No one noticed me. Without hesitation, I broke open the lid of the bottle. The perfume drenched his feet. With a slight smile, he he looked at me. And then, I did something I had not planned. I covered, I covered his feet with my hair, washing them with my tears. I had no choice. He was Messiah, worthy of anointing. This, This was the celebration that everyone hoped for, of who we hoped for. I kept the bottle and the memory. The perfume was not wasted. 
he, he was the most special occasion. Will you pray with me? God, we ask that you would be with us in this time together, God. God, we ask that you would speak through your scriptures, Lord, that my words would be a reflection in your heart, nothing else. And we ask that as a community that you would grow us closer together by drawing us closer to you tonight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This Sunday, we're going to have a guest preacher, Joe Nettesheim. I hope I got that right. I think I got that right. Yeah, Joe Nettesheim will be preaching this Sunday. He is the executive director of Family Promise, and uh, I've, I've heard you guys loud and clear, so I've taken a Sunday off of preaching, and uh, we'll have another voice. Um, thanks for laughing at that, Al. And uh, we'll have another voice here, and I'm excited for Joe. Joe's going to preach on the Gospel of John version of this story. Um, and, then, and actually, at the end of April, just a heads up, we have another guest preacher who's in the house with us tonight, Mrs. Beth, who's promised us nothing short of a 50-minute sermon, if I have that right. So, good. I'm excited. Um, less of me and more of you. Uh, but, but Joe's going to, I don't know the direction Joe's going to go, but I know that it's important to remember that this story shows up in all four Gospels, because that's not the case about other stories in the Gospel. So remember that tonight. I want to just start by telling you a quick story. I told you uh, about a year or so ago a story about when my wife and I were in the process of moving to Waterford, and our house uh, was up for sale, and so that meant, uh, and then maybe there was an accepted offer. I don't know. She knows this story better than me, but anyways, our dog had gotten uh, curious around a skunk, and the last month that we owned our home, as people and inspectors were coming in and out, it just smelled of skunk. And it was kind of like a final farewell to Kenosha. So I shared that story, but there was another skunk story many, many years before that. Before we had kids, I had played, uh, and I was in a band, and, and my wife was out of town, and, and we had a gig, and I got done late, and I grabbed some unhealthy food from McDonald's. And I came home, and it was a beautiful summer night. All the windows were open, and I was just sitting there watching TV and getting ready for bed. And all of a sudden, I just smelled skunk in the house, which was confusing to me. So I, I go outside quickly, and my dog is investigating a skunk and sneezing. And so I get him inside, and if I'm honest, I spent maybe five minutes trying to clean him up, but I was so tired that I just figured, oh, what the heck? And so we went to bed together in our bed, in the master bedroom. The next morning, yeah, yeah, I realized what a terrible idea that was. And I remember uh, telling my wife my decision-making process that evening and how disappointed she was as well. So all that is to say, I thought about smelliness and how smells can impact experiences and moments so much. And I wonder sometimes when we read the Bible, and I don't know what it's like when you read the Bible. I, I don't know if, if reading the Bible is a chore for you, if it's exciting for you. Um, there's times when I'm reading parts of the Bible that it feels like a chore, uh, just because you don't know why all this information was put in there. Why, why was it important for us to read these things? But more often than not, I find myself with curiosity being surprised as I enter Scripture. And one thing I want us to remember about the Gospels is they are the closest we can get to understanding who Jesus was and is, is that all of these things, all of these times, all of these people, all of these places were real. And so I think if you pay attention to these Gospels, the smells in these Gospels are very real. The smell of water being turned into wine the smell of wet stones as they would walk from town to town, the smell of that bread being made on that Thursday evening before his execution, the smell, as we read two weeks ago, of Lazarus after being dead for four days wasn't a good smell. The Bible is full of these smells, and today I want you to just imagine perfume back then was not something that we would just have a few bottles of in our pantry or, or, or our closet at home, right? This was an expensive item, usually reserved for those who had money, or if you had some, like she indicated in this video, it was held for a very special occasion. And so she cracks this, and she pours it over the Messiah, who she names in Scripture as the Messiah. It says in one version in, in Luke and in the Gospel of John that she uses her hair to wash his feet. She knew that something powerful, something important was happening, and she wanted to be as close to her God as she could. 
It's a challenge to all of us. How close do we actually want to be to our God? Do we want to, do we want to dive into an intimate relationship with our Savior, or do we want to keep him at hand's length? Bethany is where Lazarus is from. Bethany is where Jesus was. He, remember, he had come back. He had, this is all, if you're tracking through the Gospel of John, this timeline, he had come back, raised Lazarus from the dead, and then in the Gospel of John, it moves right in to this story, and then it's Palm Sunday. So he's reclining. It's a few days before everything terrible or wonderful or however you want to describe it is about to happen. And she anoints Jesus. And it's lost on the disciples, as as it usually is. She prepares him, Christ says, for burial. Imagine being in that room. What are you talking about? Burial. You just got done eating a delicious meal. You're reclining. You seem content. What What do you mean, burial? And they double down, right? They go after her. You could have sold this. Well, you know how much money we could have gotten for this? The poor could have used that money. And Jesus, pay attention, Jesus does this a bunch. Jesus turns to his disciples and he rebukes them. You're always going to have the poor with me. But you're only going to have with me with you for a little while. Her act of love, that's what I'll call it, it it was absurd. She had been saving this forever, and then she used it all on one person, going so far as to use her hair to wash away things and to also join in that, that anointing with him. It's an act of love, but it does seem absurd. A pound of perfume is what Scripture says she used. A pound, that's a bunch of perfume. That's probably how much I put on in high school, though. I, I'll be honest with you. I had a bunch of romance or curve. Anybody remember curve? No, was that lost in this whole generation? Okay. Ray, nothing? All right. That was the cool cologne to have when you were in high school. But anyways, a pound of perfume is a bunch. And then she wipes it up with her hair. And they get so upset. Have you ever had a, a, an extravagant display uh, for God that has been chastised by somebody? Have you ever done something for God or in the name of God, where someone has accused you of wasting your time or doing the wrong thing? Remember what happens just a few days later. Jesus sits with his disciples and washes their feet. Washes the feet of the one who's going to betray him, the one who's going to deny him, the the rest who are going to scatter. This was an intimate and powerful act. And Christ names it as so. And then the disciples Golly, the disciples, don't you just, you're sitting there with them, and most of the time you're kind of nodding your head with them, like, yeah, man, like, they're not, they, they got a good point, Jesus. Like, <laughs> you could have, like, you've been talking to us about the poor for, like, years, and now you're doused in perfume? Like, I'm just confused. And Jesus says, the poor will be with you always, but you do not always have me. Some have, some have corrupted that text over the years, and actually, recent biblical scholarship has actually gone a long way in clarifying it, which is great. But, but people have corrupted that text as a way of excluding seeking justice for the poor from the realm of proper Christian behavior by quoting that verse, saying essentially the poor will always be here, so what's the big deal? But that's not at all what Jesus is saying here. That's not at all what he's saying in the original language. That's not at all what he's saying in the context of the setting he's in. What Jesus is saying is that I am going away. They hadn't caught that. But he's also saying, listen, if you're truly going to follow me, like really, buy into this thing. If you're going to be all in for me, then you're going to only ever be where the poor are. You're going to only ever be where the oppressed are. That's where you're going to be led to because that's where you're going to find me. A professor of mine from seminary, uh, scholar Matt Skinner, he said uh, that we read this text with Old Testament, Old Testament commandments to care for the poor in mind. That's how we should view this. It's as if Jesus was saying, look, if you follow me, like if you put aside everything else, that new life thing that I'm talking about, you don't have to go to the cross like I did. Instead, you have to admit you need new life each and every day. If you're willing to do that, then wherever you serve, the poor will probably be there and you'll be advocating for them. You will always be equipped by God to do right by people in need. So there is never any need to be stingy with gifts. We should always do, outdo one another in giving to each other. My life could end very soon, says Jesus. Mary's act of love is fortifying me to follow this hard path. Imagine being Jesus. What a lofty thought. 
He knew his death was coming. Remember, Jesus was fully human, fully God. Jesus, days later, would sit in the garden and pray, pass this cup for me, and weep tears of blood. His very human self understood what was happening. And just for a moment, generosity that he gives so freely to the world was lavished upon him by someone who names him as Messiah. It's a both-end kind of love. You can love Jesus and love the poor, and you have to love each other. You have to love each other in order to find strength to do so. So here's the big lesson, I think, for tonight. Our ability to love God, here's what she teaches me in this scripture. Here's what Jesus teaches the disciples. Our ability to love God is tied directly to our ability to love the poor. Or doubling down, Jesus says, our ability to love God is, di- is tied directly to how we love each other. You, you want to say you love God, but then how you love each other will be a reflection of how you love God. How you treat each other will be a reflection of what you understand about how your God calls you to treat people. Mary's actions came at a cost for her. She was accused by men, and being accused of men back then wasn't a great thing to have happen to you if you were a woman, especially a woman of very little account who was giving away something that was worth a lot of money, yet she was brave. She risked being criticized by other Jesus followers for such a sensuous, lavish display of love. But she knew that her faith was a faith of abundance and not a faith of scarcity. That's what we talked about last weekend. It wasn't a faith of a scarcity. It was a faith of abundance, believing that God would fill in those moments when we know without a shadow of a doubt we cannot journey on alone on our own understanding. Your ability to love others is tied directly to the way that you love your God. So friends, I, I would encourage you to not be afraid like the disciples, to love lavishly and extravagantly like this woman in today's story. And to recognize that how you treat others is a direct reflection of the relationship you have with your creator. And may it be one of unconditional love. Amen? Amen, Amen, friends. I invite you to stand as we sing praises to that loving God. Amen. Friends, please be seated. I invite you to join me in praying for our church, our community, and the whole world. Let us pray. Oh God, grow our love, Lord. 
Lord, draw us in. Help us to lean into you, Lord, to lean closer. Lord, help us to draw our source of wisdom, our source of mercy, kindness, forgiveness, and above all else, love from you and nothing else. Help us to love you and love others the way you have taught us. Help us to display our love extravagantly like the woman in today's scripture. Lord, in your mercy. God, I know there are people in this room and in our community who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit. God, we lift them up to you, God. We know that you hear our prayers, that you offer comfort, you offer your presence. Use us as your presence in the world, Lord. God, we pray especially tonight for Connie and Barbara. Pray for Jerry, Sherry, and all others that we lift up on our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy. God, we thank you for the lives of those saints who have gone before us. We pray for continued healing during this time of grief for our dear friend Gordy and his family and his passing. Lord, in your mercy. God, all these prayers and those left unsaid, we lift up to you knowing that you are a God who hears our prayer and responds. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Friends, before the blessing, just a reminder that we have choir rehearsal after worship. A big thank you again for joining us in worship today, Selena, and, and the beautiful music. Um, that was awesome. Thank you. And um, yeah, I don't know. Any other announcements? Good. Well, then receive this blessing today. May the God who showers us with extravagant love and builds us up to be a church that loves extravagantly, may that same God bless you now and forever. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, uh, I invite you to stand one more time as we sing Jesus Loves Me this evening. Friends, go share the good news of Jesus Christ. We will share the love of life and life of Jesus Christ with all who believe. Thanks, God. Amen. 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 Amen.